Good afternoon, this is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. We have the pleasure today of having Ashish Tandon, a neurosurgeon from India. He's going to do India Neurosurgical Grand Rounds, and I'll let him start right away. Welcome, Ashish. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, John, and uh, I'm really happy to be again uh, uh, sharing uh, my thoughts on uh, a uh, very important uh, subject that uh, neurosurgeons and spine surgeons deal with, and it's uh, craniovertebral junction. Uh, so the first part, it, it would be a series of two or three lectures. So the first part is uh, about clinical anatomy and biomechanics. It's a very small part, but it is very, very, very important to, for all of you to understand uh, uh, the mechanics of CBJ. And, what I have done is I have broken uh, these series into smaller parts and then we can discuss. Now, what I would uh, really like is uh, if everybody of you can unmute yourself so that we can have a two-way discussion. That is very important and that's what uh, John wants me to do as well. So I'll be asking you questions at relevant times and uh, I would really love to have answers from all of you. Is that okay? Is that okay? Well, well, the Ashish is a logistical problem. If everyone unmutes, it's a, it's, it causes too much noise. Okay, so people okay. have to be on top of their button and unmute themselves, okay? Okay. Great. So, uh, please, uh, you are free to interrupt. You, uh, you are free to unmute yourself and answer the questions. So let's start. And... Uh, uh, as we all know that uh, craniovertebral uh, junction is uh, formed by basiocipit, the atlas, which is this, the axis, uh, which is this part. Can, can uh, you see my uh, cursor? Yes, we can. Yeah, great. And as we all know that this is the most mobile segment of the whole of uh, the spine, and it houses very important neural and vascular structures. So that is why a very good understanding of normal CVJ is important to, you know, understand the pathology and the abnormal anatomy. What I find amongst uh, uh, the students whom I come across is, there are a lot of myths and there are misunderstandings about CVJ, which I would try to clear today. Now, uh, the clivus forms the bezion, which is the anterior lip of uh, foramen magnum, and the occipital squama forms the posterior part, which is the opistheon. And then you have the two occipital condyles. Now, today, I would, most of my lecture would be around occipital condyle and C1. So let's first understand OC1. When we talk of CVJ, everybody starts thinking about C1, C2. But first we need to understand OC1 to understand C1, C2. Now, uh, as I've told that anterior form, anterior part of the foramen magnum is formed by uh, the clivus and uh, Bezion means base in, uh, in Greek, and opistheon means the posterior part. So base and the posterior part. And that is uh, how we got to the nomenclature. Now please understand that OC1 is a cup and saucer type of a joint. So it's like a cup and saucer. So the occipital condyle is coming, and you have the C1. Fine. And it has a very loose, roomy joint capsule. There are just two main important ligament attachments, anterior and posterior atlanto-occipital membrane. So my first question is, and it is open to all, that why is OC1 such a stable joint when there are only few ligaments 
just one or two. Rather, in C1, C2, you have so many ligaments holding the C1, C2. So then why is OC1 such a stable joint? Uh, does anybody want to take this question? You can just try. Give any, any answer that you wish. Because area is, uh, of joint is large. That may be the cause. So if the area is large, you mean to say that it will be a stable joint? No. Mm, okay. Um, is it because of the cup and saucer type of the joint? Uh, it has a restricted mobility compared to the atlanto axial joint? No, but the, you, the maximum flexion and extension happens at OC1. So yeah. 25, 30 degrees of flexion extension. There's so much of movement. There's no flexion extension in C1, C2. Almost nil. True. So we can't say that there is restricted movement. It, there is a lot of movement happening at the joint. So what next? Because, because this occipital membrane is a continuation of anterior longitudinal ligament, which is considered to be a strong ligament. Okay. Yes. That, that's still... Leads, that, that, yes, that, yes. That causes that gives the stability to the joint. Okay, it gives a part of the stability to the joint. Agreed. Anyone anyone else? Okay. Now the second question is movements allowed. Okay. So the movement that OC1 allows is flexion extension, very limited rotation and lateral flexion, almost nil. Fine. Now, the third question is, what's the percentage of occipital cervical dislocation in cervical trauma? Who would want to answer this? Just, just give a random figure, you know? You don't need to be absolutely correct or specific. Just give me a random number. It's about what? 25 to 30 percent, is it? 25 uh, to 30 percent in the OC1 what? joint? Or you mean the dislocation? Yeah. Or no, no, it's it's way too high. Anybody else? Okay, there, there, I see how many participants? 30, 35 participants. How many are there, John? 34. 34. So I want more answers. Come on, come on. So he has <laughs> said 25, and I've already given you a hint that no, 25 is a very high number. Give me a fresh number. Sir, we have uh, written in the chat box actually. Less than 10%. Okay. Uh, you just, I, I can't see the chat box. So just okay. answer. Just talk to me. Okay. Okay. So okay. The, I, I'll talk about the percentage. Now, uh, somebody has to take this question. Occipital cervical dislocation is more common in children or in adults. Anybody? Children. Children. Okay. That's great. And why? Large head size compared to the, uh, the ligaments. Okay. That's, uh, that's, that's one of the reasons. That's a very good reason. Yes. Anything else? There's more flexibility in the child's spine. So if there's more flexibility, then the dislocation should be less. Dislocation happens more when the spine is rigid, you know. You can dislocate with even slight trauma. If you're more flexible, then dislocation will happen less. So that goes against the principle. Anybody else? Try, try, try. Think, think, think. Because size of the head uh, is more than the body in the children. Yeah, he has, he has already mentioned that. But, uh, uh, okay, I'll now try to answer these questions. And this is very, very important to understand uh, the whole, whole mechanism of OC1. Okay, so let's see what's happened here. Okay, so this is the... OC1 joint. Agreed? Now look here. You have a lot of motion. So uh, the question that, you know, the, there is restricted motion at OC1 is not correct. 
Okay, so you have a lot of motion, but still it's a stable joint. Now look here. Uh, okay, now what I have showed you here is the rails. Can you see this photograph? Now we know that the rails, the train is very, very stable on the rails. And why? Because of the construct of the wheels which are running on the rails. Now focus here, okay? So this is the type of uh, the wheel and rail joint here, okay? And that is why derailment is rarely, uh, you know, we come across it very rarely looking to the number of trains going around. So then this sort of explains us in OC1 as well. The occipital condyle is a convex structure which is laterally directed, okay? It is, it is laterally directed. And atlas is a lateral mass which is concave and medial. Now look here. You understand? So this is the rail and this is the wheel with, you know, something in here so that it does not dislocate. Especially there is no lateral dislocation when there is movement. And then you have the anterior and the posterior membranes which try to hold. Also, because of the shape of the joint, after a particular point of flexion, the bone to bone hitting happens. And then you can't move further. And at that point of time, the rest of the cervical flexion starts. Okay? A am I clear with this? Friends? Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes sir. sir. You, you got it, so I'll explain it once again. See, see here and then see this. Isn't there a big similarity? Sir. Yes, sir. So, so that is why. So what God has done is he has constructed the joint in such a fashion that is, it is inherently uh, stable. Okay. Now, please look here at C1, C2. Exactly opposite of OC1. So a lot of movement at O uh, at C1, C2. <laughs> Exactly opposite. Am I able to make you understand this? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. So you see the shape of the joint in itself is causing stability or instability. That's number one. Number two, God had to create this because then Otherwise, rotational movement would not have been possible. See, you can't rotate this because the joint will be banging. Here, this can come in front and go back. Fine? So that is why, you know, there is movement in here, which is a rotatory type of movement. And here, it is not possible. So because we need rotation, that is why, uh, that is the price we pay for the loss of stability at that joint. Okay, so let's move forward. Now in children, you said the head is larger. I agree because that creates a stronger vector force. Okay, but the more important thing is it's a straight joint. The fibrous strength is not consolidated in here at that age. And that is why OC dislocation is more common. It's almost three times more common in children than compared to adults. Now look here, even here, this is, this is a photograph I have taken from ISPN and it's a straight joint. So much higher chance of the dislocation. Okay. Now uh, I want to focus my attention on OC1 joint and the radiology and understanding of OC1. So that, and why am I focusing so much on OC1 is, 
so that when you are reading an abnormal CT or an abnormal MRI, you are able to understand what is happening to OC1. And where is OC1? So that you know where C2 begins because in a abnormal anatomy or in a pathological condition, you will not have the clear cut anatomy that you see in uh, normal cases. So first, let's understand this is the occiput here and these are the occipital condyles. You have the C1, you have the C2. And here on SAG, it's very important to understand that it is the cup and saucer type or it is a concave or convex type of a joint. Fine? So this is a OC1 joint. Now, how does OC1 look on an MRI? So on MRI, on coronal images, it's not a very, very well-defined joint as compared to C1, C2. So you'll always see when you see an MRI, C1, C2 comes out very clear and you may not have great clarity in uh, uh, OC1. However, in uh, sagittal MRI, occipital cervical joint or occipital atlanto joint is very clear and you need to define it. You need to study that anatomy. Okay, so this is how OC1 looks. Uh, and here uh, I've just brought it for comparison. Uh, you know, the occipital condyle in a cadaveric section here on an MRI, then the cartilage here, uh, the cartilage here. Then obviously you have the, uh, the, uh, the lateral mass. So the lateral mass and here, it's just about this much. And then you have certain ligaments. So you need to see this anatomy on both the, uh, of both the joints. So of the right as well as of the left. So you have to take thin sagittal cuts, sit and see how OC1 is. Okay. So this, this is how OC1 would look on a sagittal cut. Now, uh, again, this is a question. Uh, can somebody tell me what is, uh, what is happening in this? This is a CT cut. The question is open to all. Please introduce yourself and answer. Hello. Hello. Is anybody there? Uh, John? So. Yeah. yeah. Yes, oh, okay. I think so. <laughs> okay. Little shy. So little you shy. You, you just try, you know, you just try. Don't, don't fear. There's nothing to fear. I'll give you the answer ultimately. And if it is correct, then it is very good. No problem. If it is wrong, no problem. Just try. It'll take okay. a while for people to get used to this platform. Okay, there's something going on here. See, I'll, I'll just take you back to OC1. Look here. This is OC1. Fine. And now look here. What is the difference? Focus in here. What is the difference? So occipitalization of atlas. Uh, who has given this answer? So Ninad here. Yeah, hi Ninad. Good evening. Yes, absolutely. But it's an incomplete uh, answer. Which type of occipitalization of atlas do you see? You are absolutely correct. This is occipitalization of atlas. But which type? So uh, I, I'll give you some hints. Is it unilateral? Is it bilateral? It's a bilateral. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. See here. There's fusion going on here and here. So there is no OC1 joint here. Please, everybody understand this. Okay. And that is why of a particular CT, I have brought different cuts. Okay. Now, Nina and everybody else, there is occipitalization of atlas, but there is something more happening in here. Can anybody pick that as well? Yeah. 
So sir, there is also, yeah. Sir, C2, sir, C2, C3 fusion is also. Excellent, excellent. Absolutely perfect. And that is very, very important to pick. Okay. And why? I will just tell you. So absolutely correct answer. So you have a bilateral assimilation of Atlas with a few C23. Okay. So you have this, I have shown various types of uh, assimilation. Here you have the part of anterior assimilation, the whole of posterior. Here you see, you know, there, there is some joint seen here, but nothing is seen here. Here, anterior uh, arch is free, whereas there is, uh, you know, some fusion of the posterior arch. So there, is a, there are varieties of assimilation of atlas and you should see the CT scan cut by cut, one by one to pick OC1. Okay. And why am I telling this? I'll, I'll so have patience and try to understand that you need to know what is happening to the occipital atlant atlantal joint because it is the most important part of the CVJ. Now, assimilation of atlas, uh, when you have C1 fusion to the occiput, it can be complete when C1 is not identified or it could be incomplete anterior posterior. Okay, but this is important. Read this. It is associated in almost 50% cases where you have a C23 fusion. Okay, so the moral of the story is don't just focus on OC1 or C1, C2. Look at the complete cervical spine. Okay. Right. Now, okay. So here again, this is a bilateral assimilation of the atlas. Okay. There is no joint. You see, this is the occiput coming here. The condyle would be here and the joints are fused. Similarly here, there are two different cuts, anterior and posterior wise. And again, here is a lateral assimilation where you don't see the OC1 joint. Okay. Now, what is this? Okay, what is this? Come on, somebody. Take a chance. This is very easy. This is an easier one. Uh, this is uh, left sided uh, OC1 assimilation with coronal tilt to the right side. Okay, that's 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 very good. It is a unilateral assimilation with head tilt. Now, what is the learning story here? One, unilateral assimilation is rare. But whenever you have it, there is a very high chance that the patient would present with torticollis. So if you have a short neck with torticollis, you know, you should think about unilateral assimilation of the atlas. Fine. And, you know, understanding this is very important because, you know, you, you have to put screws in these areas. <coughs> so you, you have to know where C1 is starting, where occiput is ending because the screws are going to go here. And then, Whenever you have a head tilt, you have to decide where you need to push the joints further and where you have to do it less, you know. So for this, you need to know whether it is unilateral or bilateral. Great. Okay. Now kinematics. Now we are going a little more uh, higher up, a little more complicated. But what I would request each of the... 41 participants here that if you don't understand the kinem kinematics, please stop me and I'll try to explain it again. But I want all of you to understand this concept, the kinematics of the uh, OC1 especially very clearly. So we know that uh, flexion and extension happens in OC1 and rotation in C1, C2. Now, the first question, this is an easier one. The cervical spine canal is narrowest in flexion or extension? Sir, it is narrowest in flexion, sir, due to buckling of lig ligamentum flavor. Okay. So, uh, uh, who was this? 
sir i am dr mallappa hoggi sir yeah hi dr mallappa so uh, he says that uh, uh, the cervical spine canal is narrowest in flexion uh, anybody who wants to counter this or everybody in agrees extension it's narrowest in extension narrowest in extension who is this kabulo oh hi so uh, okay anybody who would agree with either of the two okay i i'll i'll give you that answer now in atlanto axial dislocation the cervical canal is narrowest during flexion or extension malappa flexion sir yeah ninad flexion sir so it narrows during flexion and ninad yes sir what about the cervical spinal canal is it narrows during flexion or extension ninad no that is not sure sir <laughs> okay so uh, i'll i'll answer this now this is very 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 interesting okay and why you have to understand this okay so the cervical spinal canal is narrowest on extension okay and it is roomiest when you have flexion okay so the canal diameter is much more during uh, uh, flexion than in extension however what happens when there is flexion and extension at the cranio vertebral junction okay now uh okay who can tell me what is the normal atlanto axial uh, uh adi uh, in a normal adult or a normal child how much is normal so 3 mm and 5 mm 3 mm and 5 mm so is a adi more in flexion or in extension adi will be more in flexion adi would be more in flexion like this yes sir yeah so he is correct the atlanto dental uh, distance uh is more in flexion and less in extension that everybody we all know okay now but if this is true then why is the spinal canal narrowest <laughs> in cdj area in flexion in atlanto axial dislocation so this is the question we need to ask so in cervical i'll i'll try to explain it once again in the lower cervical spine when you extend it is narrowest however in atlanto axial dislocation or in normal situation it is narrowest when you are flexing so there is a again dichotomy the the upper part the, it is narrows down the uh, lower down expands so how and why now look at this video of a knee joint okay knee joint movement <coughs> this is very important for just watch okay so this is flexion so suppose this is the head which is flexing and this is the lower cervical spine which is extending okay so now look what is happening in flexion now as the head as the head suppose this is flexion as the head goes in front okay in flexion there is movement at the other point as well this is what i wanted to emphasize through this uh, uh video now look what happens in flexion and extension when you flex the occipital condyle posterior part of the occipital condyle goes back so all of you just try to flex your head and you will understand that the posterior part of the occipital condyle is going back is that clear everybody agrees to that yes everybody agrees 
Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Yes, sir. And in extension, the anterior part of the occipital condyle will go in front. Right? Now, hello. Hello. Okay. Now, if the occipital condyle is going back this during flexion, and if OC1 is a single joint, then during flexion, why is the atlas or the, the distance between atlas and dense increasing? Can somebody answer this question? So the question is, when I am flexing, why does the atlantodental distance increase? Okay. It's uh, because okay. dense is a stable uh, uh, segment because of the dense is a stable bone uh, because of the ligamentous attachment compared to the. Uh, I mean. When yeah. compared to the uh, occipital cervical joint, yes. so because of which uh, during the flexion, the dense remains uh, because of the alar ligament and the transverse cervical ligament, yes. compared to um, which increases the joint cavity basically, or which increases the diameter of the atlanto, uh, or which increases the atlanto dental interval. You could uh, say. Is it yaksh? No, Rishab sir. Rishab. Okay, Rishabh, again, when you are flexing, the occipital condyle is going back. Where should the atlas move? Will it move that, back or will it move in front? When the, sorry? The, the atlas is going to move in front, is it? Anterior, sir. Anteriorly. So, you mean to say that this is the joint... And as, suppose this is the joint and I'm flexing, so my condyle is going back, but my atlas is going in front. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And but why does that happen? It's, it's like a transitional, uh, translation movement. Yeah. Because of which, because it's a ball and socket type of joint, so, uh, or a cup and saucer type of joint, because of which, uh, when occipital condyle goes back, uh, the other part, it, it does not actually come, but it's like virtually, which is, you know, because of the translation going ahead. No, so uh, is it virtual or does the C1 go ahead? Um, uh, uh, we can say a few millimeters, maybe. Not exactly, mummy. No. Okay, so whenever the occipital you are you are you're right whenever the occipital condyle goes posterior that means the neck is flexing the condyle in itself pushes the c1 anterior exactly okay, okay. and that okay. is why when you flex the atlanto dental index or distance increases Interval. because increases. this is just moving in front okay Okay? Yes, got, sir. Now look here. When you are flexing, this uh, hmm. occipital condyle is pushing the atlas in front. Okay? okay? And when you have extension, the occipital condyle is pushing the atlas Backwards. behind. Hmm. Okay? Okay. I hope you have understood this concept. Yes, so when yes. When I am flexing the head, Yes. Sir. Look here. Look here. Uh, look at my head. So when I'm flexing, I'm not just flexing. I'm also moving ahead. Okay. 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 We, it's not that I'm flexing and I'm going behind. The natural movement is I'm going in front. Okay. Right. Now, what happens in AAD? Very simple. In atlantoaxial dislocation, because the ligaments and joint has been disrupted between the atlas and the axis and because in flexion the atlas has to move ahead so the, because the ligament is not able to hold it back the atlas really slips in front you get me 
you got uh, this sir, point so can you repeat it once okay now see we know that the atlanto dental distance is say 3 mm in atlas right okay yes <laughs> why is it 3 mm because if the atlas tries to move further in front the c2 and its ligaments and the joints which are intact will pull it and it will not allow c1 to go further in front did you understand this yes yes and if the ligaments are strong and if they are holding then the c1 will go only which the normal variant would allow but if there is disruption of the c1 c2 and the ligaments are gone then c1 is free to move ahead so the concept that i want to bring in here is that in atlanto axial dislocation it is not c2 that is moving behind c1 it is the c1 which is going in front i hope i have made this yes, clear sir. yes sir yes sir and yes. this is a very 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 important concept to understand because most of the time the students think the reverse that you know what is atlanto axial dislocation sir the c2 is hitting the spinal cord the c2 is there it is not moving because the c3 is holding the c2 you get me yes sir so it is the c1 that is moving and when the c1 is moving in front it is taking the head and the spinal cord with it and then the dense hits it okay mm -hmm. yes yes you we see get here it's so clear the dense has not moved the c1 has c1 moved in front now look here look at uh this see here the c1 posterior arch matches with c2 right right then when yes, there is dislocation what is happening the c1 has gone in front the mm. spinal cord is here and the c2 is hitting the spinal cord right okay right yes, okay so now again i'll uh, i'll open this to everybody if anybody has not understood this whole concept please ask please stop me ask anybody don't don't feel shy or if you want to clarify something so have i has everybody understood it i think so everyone's understand yes okay so uh, to quickly uh, summarize when you have flexion the c1 goes in front the c2 remain there almost in atlanto axial dislocation because the atlas is now free to go ahead there is dislocation and the atlanto dental distance increases and posteriorly the posterior it hits the hits and anteriorly the odontoid hits and crushes the spinal cord okay right so yes, in reducible atlanto axial dislocation whenever you have injury to the cruciate ligament or when you have the c1 c2 joint rupture as i told the c1 moves anteriorly but as the joint has failed it leads to dislocation and because there is dislocation the anterior tubercle and the dense distance increases now the question again to all if there is assimilation of atlas then how on a x-ray cervical spine do you diagnose atlanto axial dislocation i'll repeat the question if there is assimilation of atlas then how do you recognize on a cervical spine x-ray that there is atlanto axial dislocation 
then we have to measure the distance between the dense and the occipital condyle sir which uh, no, that would uh, not give you uh, uh, a very clear indication also there is because there is assimilation you won't be able to uh, justify where the occipital condyle is because the condyle has fused to the c1 joint flexion extension flexion extension x rays won't show a decrease in the adi increase in the adi increase in the adi ha huh. so then how will you uh, reach to a diagnosis okay so uh, anybody wants to try this i have already given you the answer in my previous slides i showed it to you look here this is how you will this though this is a ct but on an x ray if the posterior, posterior arch is not in fused in or is not assimilated you will see that this line has been breached mm -hmm. you get me this line you know this curved line it gets breached because this will this will go in front this has gone in front in atlanto axial dislocation this is a partially assimilated but you see here you know the spino laminar line moves in front so not just you you just need not see the atlanto dental distance but you can also gather it from the <coughs> spino laminar line is that clear is that clear yes yes sir okay. sir repeat Okay. So, so I'll I'll show it to you. I'll I'll just go a little slow. See, there is okay here. This X-ray is much better. So this is the spinolaminar line. Okay, you see, this is the posterior tubercle of uh, the uh, tubercle of the posterior arch. So this line here matches with this line, and this, and this, and then it is going. but when you have even in flexion in normal variant it is all, almost maintained however when you have atlanto axial dislocation this spino laminar line the posterior tubercle posterior arch because it moves in front this spino laminar line gets disrupted so on an x ray you will see the disruption have i have you understood this now no yes sir you got it yes yes yes, yes sir okay so so just don't believe on this because assimilation of atlas is very very common and don't miss this so why should we as neurosurgeons or spine surgeons just stick to one adi to diagnose atlanto axial dislocation no we should take the whole cranio vertebral junction as one complete unit and make a try to make a diagnosis every time we see an x ray okay <coughs> okay now this is a c1 c2 joint i have already discussed and the c1 c2 joint has plenty of ligaments to support it okay so the c1 c2 will have lot of ligaments supporting it now what is basilar invagination what is bi can somebody answer what do you mean by basilar invagination this is the last slide i think uh, upward migration of uh, the odontoid uh, yes uh, in relation to the clival line or okay. upward uh, migration uh, of the odontoid in is basilar invagination okay who has answered this uh, rushab sir rushab okay now uh, anybody else who has something different to say about bi or everybody agrees proximal migration of dens sorry proximal migration of dens proximal migration of dense so proximal in the sense anterior superior 
what? No, so proximal superior. Proximal and superior is basilar invagination or migration of dense. Okay, anybody else? Uh, now, who was this? Sir, Dr. Akhilesh. Uh, yeah, hi, Akhilesh. Okay, so now, you, now, please try and understand this concept which I am telling, and this is the, perhaps the last slide will not take uh, much longer. Now, who is this gentleman? Atlas. Okay, so John has that answer. That's so nothing. I'm is, not a neurosurgeon, but I do know Atlas. <laughs> so he is Atlas, and that is why we have the Atlas bone. And he is holding the head, uh, the globe here. Now, can everybody show the show their respective videos, or even we can't see the videos? I want to watch them. Okay, now, Rishabh, Rishabh yes, is sir. there, and who is the second gentleman? Akhilesh. Okay, now, uh, Akhilesh and Rishabh, this question is to you. So, suppose I am the atlas, and I am holding the globe here. Hmm. Okay? Yes. In case my shoulders become weak, what is going to happen if my shoulders are going to, be, are going to become weaker what is going to happen if i am standing like this what will happen to the whole structure there is going to be a prolapse sir of of the vertebral column into the skull base but what is going to happen you forget about the skull base I'm okay. just asking about the globe and the man. I am holding the globe like this. Globe will fall. Okay. It is going to sir, come closer. The globe sir, dense, is going dense to come is go closer. You got dense this. Dense is going to come into the spinal canal, sir. Dense is going to come into the spinal canal and cause compression. The skull As you can see in the picture also. No, 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 no. The skull is going to come down okay. and not the dense going up. Okay. It is a different... You know, ultimately, we understand that the distance has decreased. But it is, see, when I'm standing, I can't go against the gravity up. You understand? The C2 okay. is fixed here. If the C1, C2 joint prolapses, collapses, becomes vertical, the skull is going to come down. You understand, everybody? Yes, so if, yes, this, if he becomes weak here, the globe is going to come down and not that his head is going to go up. Yes. You got okay. this? You got yes, this? Yes, so yes. This yes, is sir. basilar invagination and this is what we need to correct. When we are correcting basilar invagination, put up this <laughs> we invagination. don't pull the odentoid down. We mm. push the head up. Right. right. You got it? Yeah. Because the Perfect. C2, C3 joint is stable, fused, there is no dislocation at C23. If there would have been a disruption of C23, we would have understood that C2 is going up. But C23 is intact. You understood? Everybody understood this yes. concept? Yes, 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 yes. So yes, today, yes. today, the biggest two take home messages for everybody is one, in atlantoaxial dislocation, it is the atlas that is moving in front. The odontoid mm. is remaining there. Remaining there, yeah. And in basilar imagination, the skull is coming down. Okay. Because the weight of the skull is there. There is no weight here. You know, until unless I push the person from down, only then the odontoid is going to go up. It's pure physics and mechanics. I hope I've made this clear. Yes, definitely, sir. sir. Okay, definitely. And yes. We need to understand all this to, you know, treat the disease. Though it is just a change of the concept, but you should know the concept. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. And why? Why is this important? So, who will tell me what is DCER? What is DCER? 
distraction compression uh, reduction extension and reduction extension and reduction yes okay now let's go back let's go back so when i am first is distraction so when i am distracting the c1 c2 here, the atlas the atlas and skull are going up so the odontoid is coming down number 1 you got it yes then when you are compressing here and extending what is when the occipital condyle is getting extended what is happening to c1 coming behind yes so d c e r extension when you are extending you are bringing the atlas back because in flexion the atlas tends Goes to ahead. run away you okay. got it yes so that is why you have d c e r joint jamming because this all this lecture is thanks to ninad who pushed me to get this for all of you and you know uh, uh, he wanted me to sort of explain what should be done as far as treatment because there are so many forms of treatment anterior posterior joint jamming dcr joint distraction etc etc but i thought that you all should understand the concepts first and then we go to the treatment okay yes sir yes sir great great okay so in the next part of the lecture maybe perhaps next sunday or i don't know when john would uh, sort of uh, give us the time slot we will read we will study about vertebral artery and the clinical implications of vertebral artery today we focused on oc1 maybe the next time i'll try to show you the radiology the understanding of c1 c2 and then what are the ligaments in radiology treatment considerations so uh, thank you thank you everybody for uh, such a wonderful interactive session thank uh, you sir i hope uh, i have been able to you know simplify a little bit of uh, uh, cbj yes yes sir yes sir well, well you, you know what she should we just say this is what exactly where i can i see this platform going the uh, interactivity uh of of the speaker like yourself uh interacting with the uh students and i appreciate the students and the residents interacting with the shish i know it's it's easy to come to these uh webinars and go to sleep but you know it's also nice to interact with someone like a shish uh and we'll get better everyone's a little shy at first uh we'll get better with the sound and the mute but this is it's more than just a video it's interactive that's the true power of this uh platform yeah so if uh, uh if anybody do we have for some questions or it, 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 we are already extended the uh, no time. don't worry we can take as much time as we uh, we are interactive <laughs> anybody has any comments or anything it, it was the youtube link i'm sorry sir uh, uh, can we get youtube link for this uh, repeat yeah, session yeah, want to see let me yeah i'm going to put a link down to our channel you subscribe to the channel and you get video every time we do a video you get you get an e email to you let me put it right now in the chat box so give me a second here Okay. There are some. Uh, uh, I have some questions. Since it's a cup and saucer type because of LR ligament, this was from Jitin. Uh, so, how will the skull come down with an intact occipital atlantal joint? Okay. So, uh, how will the skull come down? As I have already uh, told you that you know, if it is basically the C1 C2 joint. that sort of uh, uh is malformed or anomalous and that causes the skull to collapse generally oc1 uh, does not lead to the collapse
Okay. Is that all or are there any more questions? No. Okay. Yeah, I'm putting so, the YouTube channel there for anyone that wants to see this video or any video that we televise in the future. Great. I'd like, to I would like to thank Dr. Ashish, uh, sir. It was an amazing presentation. And also Professor John for his efforts, his un untired efforts for whatever he is doing to bring about all these interactive sessions together. He's yeah. really made the world smaller for the resident neurosurgeons in India. Well, you know, it's the future. It's the, this is the future of conferences right here. <laughs> so you better get used to it. <laughs> I think we should also thank uh, Ninat for uh, pushing us to get uh, all this together. So, uh, thank you, Ninat. And uh, you can all interact uh, with uh, us. Uh, I've already shared my uh, email ID. So, uh, you can... Let, you me, know, let me share the screen. Let me get you off the screen share there. Okay. Yeah, yeah I see what you mean now, uh, Ashish. Is, uh, how you want to change teaching? This is this is a change a change change from those webinars that I televise. Uh, most uh, you know webinars they go into the presentation, they have a formal discussion after. Not too much inter you know back and forth you know give and take. So uh, yeah, I appreciate you pushing this type of platform. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your time. Uh, thank you. Okay, next think, week, uh, what is it going to be? Uh, thank you, sir. Next week, uh, I'll give part two of this lecture. Okay. Uh, I'll be trying to explain the C1, C2 joint about the vertebral artery and certain surgical nuances which uh, the students should be aware of. And uh, maybe uh, in the third part of the lecture, we can talk about. Uh, the various uh, uh, interesting articles, papers, which they should go through. Uh, some real world authorities who have uh, devoted their lives on uh, for CVJ. So I'll try to get that collected as well for uh, them. Okay. Uh, can we have your uh, email ID, Dr. Rashi, sir? Uh, in if in I, case to contact I, I could, or yeah, you can communicate. put it in the. Ch you see the chat, chat sir. Ashish, the chat box there, you can put it yeah, there if you want. Yeah, why not? Yeah, just put it in the chat. Doctor, there you go. You see it? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think the audience will grow. Um, because it's definitely yeah. different. So I thank all of you for coming, and I'm going to sign off. Officially, I'm going to stay on, but I'm going to sign off. So thank you very much.